It is the 17th of June, and this is Bevy coming to you from Hamtopia. Thanks for joining us today as we move on in the Reaper and the Scribe, Chapter 59. Tamara was in a daydream with absolutely nothing to do but relax when she was brought back to the present with a start. She was experiencing an unusual feeling she had never felt before. It was neither fear nor problematic. It was just a feeling that she should be somewhere else. At that precise moment, Sarah and Gavin appeared. What is going on? asked Sarah. I wasn't entirely sure until you two lovely people arrived. Now that you are here, I think we are needed elsewhere, announced Tamara. She held out both hands. Gavin took one, and Sarah took the other. Instantly, all three beings disappeared, reappearing in the realm of nature. The whole area was vivid green with foliage. Bluebells carpeted the floor, and the sky was awash with all manner of blue. Standing in front of them, surrounded by all kinds of creatures from all over her realm, mingling with animals from the past, long since extinct, stood Mother Nature. To the amazement of the open-mouthed Sarah, there were also animals that were supposed to be mythical, but as the silver-white mane of Juliantrium, the winged unicorn, was nestling on her shoulder, mythical was not a word she could use any more. The time is nigh, little one, said Tamara. Sarah's gaze moved from the unicorn to Mother Nature, who now lay upon a bed of feathers. The animals moved aside as if to make a pathway for Sarah to walk to nature herself. Sarah's hands lifted as several fairies, dressed in their finest garments, guided her, all of them smiling as they took her hands. She felt pain in her lower abdomen and looked back at Tamara and Gavin. Her sister smiled and said, Everything will be fine. You'll see. Sarah looked straight into Gavin's eyes and mouthed, I love you. Gavin shouted back, I love you, too. He then looked at Tamara with questioning eyes. Everything is fine, Gavin. You are about to witness something that has never happened before. The birth of a being so powerful that two mothers had to carry him, she told Gavin telepathically. Gavin thought back to his first meeting with Slab Girl and the whirlwind romance that had led to this day. It wasn't a whirlwind, Gavin. Many thousands of years ago, the gods created the Sentinel's lineage for the sole purpose of delivering you here today. Sarah's journey to here was laid out by the gods, yours by Atkinson himself, said Tamara in a mental whisper. As the fairies brought Sarah closer to Mother Nature, the pains grew worse and she began to scream out loud in agony. 
A wave of fairy folk flew in from the trees and lifted Sarah's legs off the ground, carrying her into the arms of Mother Nature. As soon as she was in nature's embrace, four centaurs trotted into a guard position. Protection was given to the front, back, and both flanks of Mother Nature and Sarah. Each centaur stood looking outward, furrowing the ground with their right front hooves like a bull. The four centaurs drew back an arrow and rested them onto their bows, all four pointing outwards. A ring of a thousand fairies, a stride dragon flies, hovered above, offering protection from the sky. Over the fairies, the sky had turned to a myriad rainbow. At this point, all the animals began to kneel down. Sarah's muffled screams were obliterated by the buzz of dragonfly wings, signaling that she was now totally at one with nature. It was as if the two beings were morphing into one. A cocoon enveloped both females as Sarah's screams diminished and nature's true voice sang out into the heavens. They both disappeared within the cocoon and everything grew silent. For one magic moment, all the animals, all the insects, the list maker and sentinel were still and in total silence. The midday sun disappeared as the moon totally eclipsed its brilliance. The silence was deafening, but as soon as the moon began to move past the sun, the silence broke to the loudest scream yet. As both nature and Sarah together bore down, the child of nature began to breathe air for the first time. Inside the cocoon, movement could be seen as it began to change color. Tiny cracks began to appear in its beautifully designed outer skin, and brilliant beams of light thrust outward into the heavens, announcing the arrival of the long-awaited Savior of Humanity. The sides of the cocoon broke away and fell to the ground, revealing nature's child. Woodland sparrows carrying spider webs, flew around the infant, twisting in and out, weaving a fine cloth of silk around the child. Mother Nature held her hands in the air and beckoned everyone to come and take a look. She was sitting down, quite naked, resting on her breast was Sarah, unconscious and also naked, and in Sarah's arms a child, a man-child of such beauty, with green cat-like eyes and the sweetest smile. The creatures of the forest bowed down when they gazed upon his face. Tamara leaned over and whispered, in Gavin's ear. You are the father of the greatest being to live on this earth. He will bring peace and tranquility back to this land. He is the earth's last hope, and you sired him. 
What happens now? asked Gavin. When Sarah wakes, she will kiss him and hand him to one of the centaurs, who will keep him for the first most crucial moments of his life, during which time the fairy folk will lend a hand. Then he will spend time with Mother Nature. Through thought, you and Sarah will know everything he is doing, and he will feed off you both as you go on about your ordinary and supernatural lives. Our supernatural lives? I thought we had done our part. I thought we only had to deal with a troublesome police officer, asked Gavin. So, you know about him? asked Tamara. Not as such, it's just a feeling, replied Gavin. Now nature's child is here. There will be many who will try and stop his development, which, my friend, is why you and Sarah, John Smith, Dixie, Paul Johnson, and Mr. Clark are here. But I thought it was for the Atkinson fight. No, Gavin, all that has happened was predicted in the great book and the arrival of the nature child, although a couple of years late, is the reason for our new band of warriors to protect the child to our deaths. The conversation was interrupted by the four centaurs marching past, the third one carrying the baby. As they looked over, Mother Nature was adorning Sarah in a dress made of ladybird wings that had been sewn together with threads spun by the nimble fingers of ancient elves. The garment placed on Sarah's body was a perfect fit. She felt an overwhelming feeling of euphoria and power. Mother Nature kissed her and placed her hand on Sarah's head, saying, His heart is your heart. Your love and strength is his and this will forever be. For the time being, I give you back to the sentinel known as Gavin Jackson. Know that you are the mother of the savior of all existence. But for now, return to Sarah, the wife of the earth child. Gavin Jackson. Sarah's eyes opened, and she rubbed them, drying her tears, smiling at the vision of beauty in front of her. Sarah then turned and ran to meet Gavin, saying, I'm starving! Can we eat? Gavin, who found himself in his office, not quite understanding what had just happened, inquired, What happened to Tamara? Tamara instantly arrived, saying, I will have to have that phone of yours fixed. It keeps calling me. Sarah ran into Tamara's arms and said, Now that you are here, will you come and have dinner with us? A voice, from outside of, uh, a voice from outside the office shouted, LUNCH! <laughs> Chapter 60 Chief Inspector Crawshaw was sitting in his office, his feet resting on a pile of unfinished paperwork on his desk when the internal phone began to ring. 
What do you want? Answered the chief inspector. There's a woman at the front desk to see you, sir, said the desk sergeant. Who is she? And what's her business? She works for Atkinson, Smith, and Clark, and says she has information in which you might be interested, was the answer. Bring her to my office, he said, replacing the receiver. He grinned and removed his feet from his desk. There was a knock on the door, followed by a police officer escorting the young woman. Chief Inspector Crawshaw looked her up and down, his eyes fixating on her ample cleavage. Come in. Take a seat, Miss... Uh, uh. You can call me Dixie. We have already met Dixie, although introductions didn't take place. Now, how can I be of assistance, said the chief inspector, taking his gaze away from her breasts just long enough to dismiss the police officer standing at the door. Shut the door behind you and arrange for coffee or something to be brought up. Now, Dixie, where were we? You said we have already met, and yes, we have, when you came to see Mr. Smith. I'm a secretary at Atkinson, Smith & Clark, and I have some information you might find interesting. What kind of information? I feel strange being inside a police station. I would feel more comfortable somewhere else. The more comfortable I am, the more information I might give. What do you guys do in this part of town for lunch? asked Dixie. In that case, never mind the coffee. I will take you to a place more convivial, and we can talk there while we eat, he said his lips now curling into a smile. Dixie crossed her legs, and her short skirt revealed a bit more thigh, which tore the chief inspector's gaze from her breasts, as she said, Yes, that would be lovely, chief inspector. Oh, I do so like men with power. Chief Inspector Crawshaw was on his feet in a flash, and police work became even lower on his agenda than usual, as he said, I will show you to my car. That sounds delightful, Chief Inspector, answered Dixie. As he led Dixie past the front desk, he said, Hold all my calls, no matter who they are. But what if, shut up, you fool, I said no calls. Now get on with whatever it is you're supposed to be doing, retorted Chief Inspector Crawshaw. Sergeant Glenn Simpson just looked at him and jotted something down in his notebook. As the Chief Inspector and Dixie left the police station and drove off in his car, a shadowy figure was standing in the bushes near the doorway. It stepped out into the sunlight and began to move into the police station. It took the form of Crawshaw and walked past the front desk. The desk sergeant still couldn't believe how he had been spoken to not a minute before. They both looked at each other, and Glenn Simpson put his head down and continued to write in the notepad on his desk. The imposter climbed the stairs and entered the chief inspector's office. Once inside, 
it began to rummage through the drawers of the filing cabinet, and then the desk. Upon reaching the bottom drawer, it pulled out the file and flipped through the pages, realizing it had procured the information it had come for. It merged itself into the wall to await the chief inspector's return. At the mortuary, Gavin and Sarah had arrived back after their lunch with Tamara. Just in time, the little gory pest is back. I have a wonderful job for you. But first, put on your white coat, because there's blood involved, said Tom to Sarah. Sarah jumped with delight and ran off to the changing room. Now we're alone. I need to have a word with you, Gavin, said Tom. You'll have to be quick. You mentioned blood. She'll be in that coat and back out here in a flash, said Gavin. No, she won't. I've hidden her white coat. It'll take her a while to find it. Gavin just smiled and said, What's on your mind, Tom? We had a visitor this morning. I say visitor, but it was more of, uh, uh, come on, Tom, spit it out. All I can describe it as is a strange occurrence inside your office, said Tom. Tom, we are men of science. What are you trying to say? Yes, my mind is a scientific one. But I saw doors and drawers opening and closing. The perpetrator seemed to be a dark shadow moving around, answered Tom. Gavin looked shocked and said, I will have it looked into. So you don't think I'm going mad? asked Tom. You, sir, are the sanest person I know. But I think we'd better keep this between ourselves, if you know what I mean, said Gavin. If I see it again, I will alert you to its presence, said Tom, feeling a bit more at ease now that he had informed Gavin. Gavin began to smile and motion Tom towards the changing room door, where Sarah emerged. Turning around, Tom said, You look ridiculous! Take that off at once! Sarah, not being able to find her white coat, had taken one of Tom's, the bottom of which was dragging the floor. The arms were twelve inches past her hands, but rolled up just beyond her wrists. Both Gavin and Tom giggled. Sarah stamped her foot on the ground and did that very thing, impishly removing the garment. Both men shouted simultaneously, Sarah! As she picked the garment up from the floor, she turned and took her naked self back to the changing room, and Gavin and Tom just looked at each other. Gavin raised his hands into the air and turned in the direction of his office, walking away and giggling to himself. Tom just stood there with a very red face. Your white coat is in the tea cabinet, shouted the embarrassed lab tech. Sarah came back into the room, properly attired, and said, What was it doing in there? I don't know why it was in there. Why were you naked under that coat? I'm always naked under my coat when I'm working with body parts. I don't want stains all over my underwear now, do I, Tommy? Oh, 
my name is Tom, and that was a bit too much information. Thank you very much, young lady. You asked me, but to tell the truth, though, that rough cough don't half chafe your nipples. Sarah! Just because you now know I'm gay, it doesn't mean that you have to feel comfortable talking about your intimate areas. You give me enough nightmares it is it is. Sarah giggled and said, <laughs> I've made you blush. No, you haven't. Now make some coffee. Coffee? And not tea? <laughs> I've put you in shock as well. What about this blood? Coffee first, then blood. Now go away, you vile creature. Gavin was now in his office, looking to see if anything was missing. After a thorough search, all seemed to check out, and nothing was absent. Later, he phoned John Smith. Hello, Gavin. How are you? said the Reaper. Do you believe in ghosts? Gavin asks. A strange question to be asking me. I make ghosts, he quipped. I am serious. In that case, no, I don't. Not in the Dickensian meaning of the word, that is. But people do sometimes get glimpses of beings on a different plane. Why do you ask? How would they look? asked Gavin. This is a strange line of questioning, Gavin. I'll be right over. John Smith materialized in the seat opposite Gavin Jackson. Now, what is this all about, Gavin? continued the Reaper. Tom Harper, my assistant. Yes, I know Tom quite well. So I've heard, said Gavin, a smile coming to his face. Of course, not as well as I hope to, said Smith with a knowing smile. About that, you two might need to come out pretty soon, as someone we both know and love has found out, said Gavin. Ah. Did Slam Girl wear Tom down? <laughs> Got it in one, answered Gavin. John just laughed and said it was dark in that closet, so maybe it's for the best. But that isn't why I'm here, is it? What's the problem? <laughs> A shadow lurking about in here and going through my cupboards. And drawers. That's not a ghost, answered Smith. Well, in that case, what is it? What people describe as ghosts, as I've already said, are beings in another realm. Some of them are between this life and the next one. On the plane of existence, you die. And if you have not caused danger to yourself or other humans, your soul is instantly reborn to a newborn human. That is, of course, the route for most humans. If you haven't cared for nature or humankind, you become part of the earth, as in an elemental. You then spin the rest of your existence in toil. If you have actively worked against nature, then you simply become part of the food chain, and your soul goes into a holding place for safe keeping. It then goes to the next dominant species that take over the humans when nature has had enough of the present dominant species. What about when people see relatives like 
old grandmas, parents, and children that have never done anything wrong, asked Gavin. What you have there is the mind working. If you see one of these elementals in another realm, not long after a relative has died, your mind simply puts that face to the elemental, said Smith. Okay, then, so what did Tom see? Here is where it gets a bit strange, said John. Here it gets strange, gasped Gavin. Yes, in the other realm, time is different, and there can be a gap between the soul leaving one body and arriving at the next. It's because of the scribe, Jeff, said Gavin. Yes, Jeff. Sometimes he needs time for the paperwork. So in that realm, time can be distorted to suit his needs. The human soul then simply lives in that realm until time catches up with it, which it invariably does. Okay, but what about ghosts? said Gavin. Certain people can occasionally see into the other realm. When this happens, they see the souls between death and life. They aren't ghosts, and they do not exist on the plane of existence. As I've already said, these people every now and again see into the other realm. So, what was in my office this morning? I don't know, but I will find out, said the reaper. In a pub on the outskirts of town, Chief Inspector Crawshaw was whining and dining Dixie. It is one of my rules never to mix business with pleasure. <laughs> but rules are meant to be broken. Don't you agree, Dixie? I live my life breaking rules. It's a wonder our paths haven't crossed before. In that case, <laughs> I'm too smart to be caught, Chief Inspector. I like your style, Dixie. I think you like more than my style, Chief Inspector. I don't think your boyfriend would like us having this conversation. What has my boyfriend, as you call him, got to do with this? asked Dixie, putting her elbows on the table, allowing the Chief Inspector a clear view down her cleavage. Not a thing, said Crawshaw. You took his job. Why stop there? quipped Dixie. In a dark corner, watching the seduction unfold, stood Atkinson. He grinned and was very impressed with Tamara's understudy as he returned to his realm to report the day's events to his partner. Upon his return, Atkinson went straight to Jeff Clark. To his surprise, the scribe looked different, not older, but he didn't look like a kid anymore. Is everything sorted out? said Jeff. Yes, things have been sorted, but who is the dark one? And is it going to be a problem to us? interrupted the scribe. You know he's here, then. Yes, I do. Is the child protected? asked Clark. He has been born and is with the centaurs. Excellent. I have a question for you, though, Atkinson. What is that, my friend? How do I know all this? said Jeff as he placed his quill on his desk 
and turned to face Atkinson. I've been waiting for this. In fact, I have needed this to happen. What's happened? You have quickened, and may I say, welcome back. Who are you welcoming back? asked Jeff. I gratefully welcome the emergence of your good self, now totally joined with the mind of Dewhurst. It will be a good merger, but my place is now forever in this domain. I only accept this merger on that basis. The reaping will now be performed by you and Smith alone. Agreed, old friend. Jeff Clark began to tremble and then shake. His arms were thrown outwards and light began to pulsate from his body. What is happening? screamed Jeff. Be still and just accept me, said a familiar voice in Jeff's head. Jeff lifted slowly off the ground, twirling in a counterclockwise direction. A vortex began to form around the young man as he rose higher and spun faster. With lightning flashing all around him, he shouted again, What is happening? Atkinson looked up, and in a quiet voice said, Thank you, Jeff. We couldn't have done this without your help. Although Jeff was spinning now, at great velocity, a tunnel of calm opened up before him, and inside that tunnel stood Cindy with her arms outstretched. Jeff walked towards her, and as they came together in each other's arms, the gas main under the newspaper building blew up, sending them and the rest of the people within the building to oblivion, as John Smith finally cut the mortal cords of Jeff and Cindy. The spinning vortex slowed down and returned to the ground. The flashing lightning stopped, and the dust settled and standing there was the regenerated Dewhurst in full body armor with his waist's long black hair and a sparkle back in his eyes. And so it was that the figurehead signpost at the offices on the plane of existence changed to Atkinson, Dewhurst, and Smith. A rejuvenated Atkinson and Dewhurst were now back in command, albeit with a different, but just as powerful, Atkinson. In the maternity ward of a nearby hospital, two new mothers were holding two new babies, one of them a girl and the other a boy a boy destined for greatness in the future, and a girl who would love him unconditionally. John Smith, Tamara, Sarah, Gavin, and Paul Johnson all stopped what they were doing as a sudden rush of immense power surged through their bodies, and instantaneously all their phones rang. The name Dewhurst had replaced Clark. Instinctively, everyone knew what had just occurred and went back to their business, as all knowledge of Jeff Clark had disappeared 
from their collective consciousness. Dixie's phone was silenced by Atkinson, but she felt everything that her comrades had shared. However, as she was under cover, she showed no outward sign of euphoria. The lunch was over, and Chief Inspector Crawshaw was driving Dixie back to the police station. His hand crept onto her knee, and she offered no resistance. Well, Dixie, should we go back to the police station? Work can wait. Who wants to talk about accountancy and stuffy old police work? I can think of much better things to do, smiled Dixie. In that case, your place or mine, said Chief Inspector Crawshaw. Yours, darling, we don't want to be disturbed now, do we? The car suddenly sped up as the eager Chief Inspector put his foot down hard on the accelerator. So, what was it you wanted to talk to me about? For now, let's not talk about work, because you wouldn't believe what goes on there, said Dixie. What would you say if I told you? I already knew, said the arrogant chief. Believe me, Chief Inspector, you don't, she answered. I have worked there for years, and I don't know all that goes on there, but I know enough to interest you, she continued. In that case, if you are good to me, I will show you something that will blow your mind if you are a very good girl. I can be the best girl you have ever had, if you are worth it, she answered. Chief Inspector Crawshaw knew by later that afternoon there would be another notch added to his bedpost. He smiled smugly as his conceited mind looked forward to an afternoon of lust with the idiot girl at his side. Back in the other realm, a young Dewhurst was a magnificent sight to behold. He stood almost nine feet tall, slim with a muscular build. His long, raven-black hair fell all the way down his back, and not a hair was out of place. His body armor shone like new. From his features, you could tell it was Dewhurst, but only just. This god of death now had all the ancient knowledge combined with a young, strong body, and it felt good. He walked over to Atkinson, extending his hand in friendship. Atkinson duly obliged. Well, how do you feel? asked Atkinson. Rejuvenated, answered Dewhurst. Your dwelling is ready for you. Also, you can come and go as you please now. There is no restriction on how many of us can be in the same domain at the same time, instructed Atkinson. Oh, that does sound wonderful as an idea, but what are the consequences? asked Dewhurst. I don't foresee any that can't be overcome. He answered, We shall see. This time, though, as I've said, I don't want to reap. I want to observe the humans, to see if they are indeed worth saving. Dewhurst then turned and walked towards his great desk, picked up his quill, 
and started writing names in the old book. He was back, doing the job created for him alone and happy to be there. The drive came to an end as the chief inspector's car pulled into his driveway. He exited and walked towards the front door. Dixie raised an eyebrow in disgust at this animal's manners and helped herself out of the car. She then followed him up to his front door. He unlocked the door and walked inside, allowing the door to fall back towards Dixie, who had to stop it with her hand. The thought of tearing this insignificant human in half was hard to keep as a thought, but she knew she couldn't harm the pathetic worm. Come in. Make yourself comfortable. Would you like a drink, or should we get straight on with it? I thought we weren't going to talk about work, said Dixie. I'm not, said Crawshaw. Incredible. What an asshole, she thought to herself. Looking at him, she said, What have you in mind? The bedroom is right through there, he said, pointing at the bedroom door. Dixie smiled and walked in the direction of the bedroom. Looking over her shoulder at Crawshaw, she said, You'd better be good, because if you are one of these quickie types, I may have to rip your head off and eat it. You know what we accountants are like, my darling. Chief Inspector Crawshaw gulped. He knew she was just joking, but he had seen photographs of people with their heads torn from their bodies in this very city. <clears throat> uh, this is all moving a bit too fast. Let us just get to know each other a little bit better first, said a less confident chief inspector. Dixie just smiled and said, That works for me. Shall we go back to your office and put our minds together instead of our lust? Yeah, let's do that. Dixie's knees escaped the groping fingers of the chief inspector on the journey back to the police station. At their arrival, the chief inspector walked straight past the front desk without looking at anybody. "'Are you okay, sir?' asked Sergeant Glenn Simpson, being slightly confused as he thought the chief inspector had already returned to his office just after leaving. He just walked on by, taking no notice, and Dixie gave the sergeant a wink. The desk sergeant smiled. Once inside the office, Crawshaw was not his usual bombastic self. This girl had frightened him, and his male supremacist stance had taken a knock. Was it frivolity, or was she serious about her actions? thought the detective chief inspector. He was hoping the police station gave him some sanctuary, should she be one of the monsters that presided over the old accountancy firm. Shall I show you mine, or do you want to show me yours, chief inspector? asked Dixie, her lips curling into a grin. Uh, well, uh, we don't have much time, for I am a busy man. So, uh, what did you want to tell me? stuttered the chief inspector. Do you know what commodities our accountancy firm deals with? I know that it isn't money, 
he answered. Well done, Chief Inspector. Out with it. As I said, I'm a busy man. You'll find it hard to believe what I'm about to tell you. <laughs> You're only a mere secretary. I will tell you what I know, and that I am probably more in the know than you are. I don't think so, Chief Inspector, said Dixie as she stood, then moved over to the window, allowing the bright sunlight to shine through her dress, showing off the outline of her curves. He turned to view the show and stated, You work for the Grim Reaper. A little theatrical, my dear, but yes, I suppose I do. So, what else do you know? asked Dixie, as she parted her legs slightly, allowing the sun to outline the inside tops of her thighs. That your Mr. Atkinson was responsible for a lot of unsolved murders, that your boyfriend couldn't pin on him. Ooh, you do know your stuff, Chief Inspector. But let's be serious. You cannot arrest our Mr. Smith for being the Grim Reaper now, can you? Just imagine the paperwork. And it is also hard to arrest a killer who is already dead. Now, Chief Inspector, what if my files placed me as a witness to everything that occurred during the murders at the end of the last century? You could be the man who closed the case. The chief lifted his gaze from Dixie's transparent backlit dress and said, You have such a file? I do, said Dixie. I could solve all the murders? Indeed you could, Chief Inspector. Where is this file? It's in my safekeeping and at your disposal, if you are a good boy. When can I see this file? I will be in touch, Chief Inspector, said Dixie, as she picked up her handbag from the desk and strolled towards the door. Chief Inspector Crawshaw drooled whilst he watched every movement of her bottom as she crossed the floor and then left the room. Leaving the police station, Dixie depressed the A button on her phone and was instantly transported to Atkinson. What do you have to report? asked Atkinson. Dixie, who was kneeling, said, The game is afoot, my lord. Good work, Dixie. Did you sense anything worrying about Crawshaw? No, sire, but there was something else in the room, something listening to the proceedings. From what realm? asked Atkinson. Dixie looked up at him and said, The dark realm, sire. At this point, Dewhurst came in and said, Nothing has come out of the dark realm for over two thousand years. What makes you think it was from that realm? I could sense it, my lord. I couldn't see it because it merged into the wall. Did it know you had sensed it? No, sire. The pulses that it gave off did an alter. I was monitoring it the whole time I was there. Report your findings to Tamara at once. You have done well, said Dewhurst, 
Thank you, sire. Remember, it's just thank you, reminded Atkinson. Sorry, sire, said Dixie, as she depressed the tea button on her phone, but stayed where she was. I'm already here, Dixie, said Tamara, as she walked in and knelt in front of Dewhurst. Welcome back, my lord, she said. The my lord thing, it's never going to change, is it? said Atkinson. Both Tamara and Dixie shook their heads. So be it, sighed Atkinson. List maker, take your apprentice and discuss your next move on the police officer. Leave the dark realm to us, instructed Dewhurst. Tamara and Dixie disappeared back to the plane of existence and reappeared in John Smith's office. The two gods of death looked at each other. Atkinson, now deep in thought, said, I thought the battling would have stopped now that everything is in its place. No, my friend, the beings from the dark realm will try and take over while we are in this transitional state. Also, they know the child of nature has been born, so it is the optimum time for them to strike, said Dewhurst. In the Reaper's office, the two list makers were sitting, drinking tea, when John Smith walked in. Hello, what are you two up to? We have a police person to disgrace, said Tamara. Poor chap, you don't know what's about to hit him, said Smith. What do you mean? We are good girls, said Tamara. Exactly. Our Mr. Crawshaw deserves your special attention, after what Paul told me about him. Now that you are both here, I have a question for you. Fire away, said Tamara. What do you know of shadowy demons? It turns out Gavin has had one going through his drawers, said Smith. How positively uncomfortable for him, said Tamara. You see, I knew as soon as those words left my lips, you were going to say something like that, said Smith. Tamara just smiled, and Dixie said, I have sensed it in Crawshaw's office, too. It is from the dark realm, informed Tamara. And what, pray tell, is the dark realm? inquired Smith. The short explanation is that when you reap the soul of a bad person, like a murderer, for instance, there is no rebirth into humanity, so the soul is stripped and placed in safe keeping. The soul is then placed in, in the dark realm, interrupted Smith. Yes, answered Tamara. So why is it here and not in its realm? He asked. The dark realm wants the child. If said child is brought up in that realm, it would be just as powerful, but it would destroy rather than mend said Tamara. Where does Chief Inspector Crawshaw fit into all of this? That is what Dixie is working on. It will need a body to exist within this realm, so it will choose one that is not of good virtue, and he perfectly fits the bill, she explained. So, 
What we are dealing with here is pure evil, but it doesn't have a form. So it will consume Chief Inspector Crawshaw, said Smith, if it hasn't already. How could you tell the difference between Crawshaw and pure evil, she said, compared to the creatures that exist in the dark realm? Crawshaw is an angel, said Tamara. Well, let's hope more of them don't follow, then, said Smith. The two list makers just looked at each other, and then Tamara said, Oh, mark my words, this is just the beginning. Back in his office, Chief Inspector Crawshaw was going over what had happened that afternoon. A strange lunch date from hell, but the promise of greatness. Ho, 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 yes. He would be the one who settled the cases that no one else could. Then something caught his eye, and the room darkened. A mist of swirling blackness came from the wall and engulfed him. A heavy feeling of dread and despair took over his being. It felt like he couldn't breathe, and he began to feel dizzy. It all became too much for him to bear, and he passed out on the floor. The evil had found its new host to be very welcoming and merged with ease within its unconscious body. Time passed in Crawshaw's office and the air was heavy with crushing despair and hate. The man that was sitting in the chair had been totally in engulfed by that long, dormant evil, and was ready to begin his work. But now he belonged to a new master. <laughs>